chapter number one, and I want to try to tie up the loose ends of a message that I started from Joshua. Remember about God's part and man's part. Now, I know that God is sovereign and He can do anything He wants to do. One of the attributes of God is that He always is going to be right. He always does the right thing. And in that rightness of God, that righteousness of God, He, of course, is sovereign, but He has chosen to use man. He consequently has chosen that man fulfill some obligations that he has laid at his doorstep. In other words, I know that most conscientious people would come to a conclusion that they're not very much, they have not much to offer God whatsoever. They would come to the idea that if anything is ever done through them for the Lord, it'll have to be God that does it. I know that that would be a right attitude for us to have. And still, even at that, brothers and sisters, God has laid out some ideas for us that He wants out of us. Uh, there are some things in the Bible that are conditional. Are, do I not speak the truth? Uh, when it comes to salvation, we're saved by the grace of God. Praise the Lord for it. And we're kept by His grace and power. But when it comes to the blessings of God on our life, many times that's going to reflect what we do as a human being with our life before the Lord. There's just no getting around it. Man is a responsible creature before God Almighty. And you can take an attitude of, I can do anything I want to do and God's going to do anything He wants to do if you want to. But God has put many things in His Word, I believe, that teach us, you do such and such, and I'll do such and such. You don't do such and such, and I'm not going to do such and such. I believe that man must understand he has a responsibility before God Almighty. Now, in this first chapter of Joshua, I said that God would do His part. In verse number 5, the Bible says, the Lord speaking, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And certainly we can trust the Lord to do His part. The problem is not with the Lord doing His part. Where doth the problem begin and end? With us. You know, folks, I believe that we really need to be serious in understanding and realizing that how we live does make a difference to God Almighty. What we do with our lives does make a difference to the Lord. And so he lays out before Joshua here, and one of the things I would said that God wanted us to do was to be strong in the Lord. We can be strong in the Lord, I know, only because God gives us strength. Do I not speak the truth? Which one of us would say we are strong in ourselves? Oh my goodness, what a joke that would be. On the other hand, there is merit in understanding that we can be strong because God will strengthen us. He said, I will be with thee. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I know that Jesus said, without me ye can do nothing, right? But the other side of the coin to that is, with the Lord we can do something. We need to be strong in the Lord. 
And as I tried to mention uh, to a degree in talking about being strong in the Lord, uh, what is your strong point? Different people talk about other people's strong points. Well, okay, good. I'm for that. Um, I would that somebody could say uh, his strong point is the Lord. His strong point is in the Word of God. His strong point is loving God. His strong point is trying to walk with the Lord. Only be strong. And I want to try to get to some other things this evening here to finish up this idea in the first part of the book of Joshua down through verse number 9. He said in verse number 6, Be strong and then of a good courage. A lot of times in living for Christ, it just takes some old-fashioned courage. A lot of us are a little bit shy in that area. There's no doubt about it. We don't want our peers to think badly of us. Uh, we don't enjoy making people mad, at least for the most part. <laughs> Sometimes I think people get a bang out of making people mad, but for the most part, uh, most of us want others to like us. Uh, most of us want others to uh, not run and hide when they see us coming. But if we're going to live for the Lord, it's going to take some courage because of our personalities and our fallen sin nature that I think the devil uses to want us to be accepted with the in crowd. I think we better understand and realize that it's going to take some courage to live for the Lord. I have known ministers before who faced some real problems in their churches and in their congregations and in, in their families, uh, obstinance even. And it took some real courage in some of the stands that they took for the Lord. Uh, brothers and sisters, it takes some courage for the leaders of a church to try to keep a church on a correct path for Jesus Christ. We're living in a day of compromise. We're living in a time zone when people, I think, have the wrong idea of what success before God is. We too much think that numbers and grand crowds and a lot of hallelujah is success before God. Not so, not so. And it's going to take some courage out of an individual if they're going to be anything for God Almighty. You can put that down. Of course, courage brings to our minds thoughts that of needing to be brave. Uh, when I think of that, I am automatically thinking that there are those times of need when a person has to, how can I put it, collect their thoughts, take some good deep breaths, and determine that they're going to stand for the Lord. It takes courage. And God told Joshua be strong and of a good courage. There can be the wrong kind of courage. But God says be strong and of a good courage. That would obviously be good in the eyes of God Almighty. I think that in this business of courage, a signal is sent to us that there are going to be times in our lives when we're going to wish we didn't have to face some stuff. Have you ever come across that? There are going to be times in our lives when we're going to just wish it would go away and we wouldn't have to deal with it. Uh, well, thank God for prayer. Uh, thank God that we can go to Him in prayer. And oh, how many times has He taken care of it for us. I praise His name for it. 
But I got to tell you, you just as well get ready. There are going to be times in your life, if you're going to live for the Lord, when you're going to have to muster up some courage. Now again, I realize that in ourselves, well, where's the, what kind of courage do we have? I mean, it's easy to make a brag on how courageous we are and how strong we are until the test comes along. And then we're going to have to tap into somebody's courage other than our own, and that's the time to tap into the courage that God has to offer to us. Now, I can't help but cite, if I may, 1 Samuel chapter number 30. In 1 Samuel chapter number 30, do you remember there? If I can for time's sake be brief. Uh, do you remember how that, uh, boy, they had come along and fought against David, ransacked his uh, stronghold while he was gone? He came back, his family was gone, the goods were gone. Uh, the enemy had really done a number on David and his people. And do you remember where the people were ready to undo David? The people were mad at David. A lot of times when things go wrong, especially in the church, <laughs> the buck stops at the preacher's desk, I guess. But, um, I mean, the people were about ready to stone David and and they were, they were discouraged. They were all out of sorts. Their, their whole life had been, as it were, ruined. But you're going to find an interesting thing in David. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now I know the encourage would bring to our thought a little different flavor to that word, but I want to put it this way. Do you need courage? Have you ever been in a place where you wish you had more courage? David encouraged, encouraged himself in the Lord. And going along with being strong, he found that strength in the Lord. You can read the chapter carefully and see how that David indeed by going to the Lord... God, how can I put this? God gave him the courage that he needed to go on. I remember before in my life asking different people, kind of in the vein, how could you ever face such a problem, such a disaster, and go on? And I remember the one lady in Denton told us if it hadn't been for the Lord, she couldn't have done it. I tell you folks, there are times in our lives when we've got to understand and realize that it takes courage to face the problems. It takes courage to take a stand for the Lord. Are we going to do it or are we going to cave in? to the prevailing winds around us, whether they be political or religious or whatever the case may be, moral. May God help us to understand that He wants us to be of a good courage. We'll go a little bit further. He goes on to say in verse number 7, Only be thou strong and very courageous. Now look at it. Here's kind of a key that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Of course, all of us, I think, would like to be prosperous. I think God gives us a clue here and a key to prosperity, real prosperity, not false prosperity in living. And he says that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. Now, that statement is full of thought. For one thing, do you need courage? Observe the law. Observe the Bible. Get in the Word of God. That's where you're going to find strength. And I, I as you guys know, 
think of the word both incarnate and written. Word of God. Get closer to the Lord. Are you lacking in strength? Are you lacking in courage? Are you lacking in taking a proper good stand for the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, the stand that God would be pleased with? Get into the Word of God. Get in the Bible. Here's what he says. That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. Not part of it, but all of it, if I may so say. Uh, people are bad about emphasizing some parts of the Bible that they like and forgetting the rest of it. Well, we need to be people who take the whole counsel of God. And one thing needed in our churches today is word preaching. We have enough entertainment. We have enough... Um, no, no, nothing wrong with eating. Nothing wrong with meals around church. I'm for it. I, I mean, I grew up a Baptist. I, 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 I'm for eating. Marcia is quite looking at me now. I, I, I know what's in that look, uh, Marcia, because I'm not a big eater. It's neither here nor there to me. When she was gone to San Angelo, uh, she wanted to make sure I ate while I was gone, while she was gone, and I did. Uh, I tried to eat healthy food uh, while uh, she was gone. Uh, the closest health place I could find was McDonald's. Uh, so, but um, she's looking at me a little uh, questioningly here. And, uh, now I'm for eating. Don't don't misunderstand. But I got to tell you folks something. In the Church of Jesus Christ, we need word preaching. And when I say word preaching, I want to say this: the word needs to be central in the church. Boy, if you can go to a church and you don't need your Bible, I'd find another church to go to. If you can go to church and the, the bulk of the service is not teaching and preaching of the Word of God, I'd find another church to go to. I tell you what, folks, people in the pew need to have an attitude of demanding that the man in the pulpit bring the Word. As we look for a characteristic in a minister or whatever, it ought to be somebody that brings the Word of God. Does he love the Word? Does he love the incarnate Word? Does he love the written Word of God? Oh, how we need to observe to do according to all of the law of Moses. And I can't help but think of James, uh, chapter number 1. Would you turn with me over there in the New Testament, please? In James, chapter number 1, the Bible says, uh, I'm going to begin my reading in, oh boy, I'll start verse number uh, 16. Do not err. My beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with what? The word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Now you can put down, be of good courage by that. I want to stress the good courage that we need. I think some people take... A stand for the Lord in the wrong manner, in a kind of hateful, mean-spirited way. God help us to have the personality that He would be pleased with. God help us to take the stand that He would be pleased with. Not the stand that pleases us, but the stand that God would be pleased with. Now, let me go along here further. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, 
lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness what? The engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And I got to admit, I think I'm getting close to being absolutely right when I associate the incarnate word with the written word of God as we approach that phrase, the engrafted word. Because you get the thought process involved there of the living word engrafted in us. And oh, how we need Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and how we need the Bible, the Word of God Almighty. Now going a little bit further, here's what he says. Receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now that's what it says. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Now you want to sink your teeth into some meat of the Word of God, there's something you can sink your teeth into. It's a promise of God that He's given. And I tell you folks, when it comes to this business of observing the Bible, as God told Joshua back in Joshua chapter number 1, I'm thinking to myself, we really need to come to grips with this truth here about observe to do all of it. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. I believe that it is right that we understand or maybe I should say try to understand because we humans are going to have a little trouble uh, getting a full understanding of the Word of God. But it is right that we try to approach to understanding the need of the Word of God in our lives day by day. Would to God we put as much emphasis on the Bible as we did the television. Would to God we put as much emphasis on the Word of God as we did sports. Boy, that would change some things, wouldn't it? Would to God we could get as stirred up about the Word of God as we could about politics sometimes. Nothing, nothing wrong with, uh, with <laughs> politics. And so on. But isn't it true, brothers and sisters, you know, what stirs us up? A lot of times I'm afraid that we're stirred up by worldly things, many things of which hey, it may not be wrong in themselves, but what about the Word of God? We, we go to church and we, uh, we sing the songs and I'm for the right kind of music in church. To me, church is about two things, the singing and the preaching. That's what church is really about. And we go to church, what, for a couple of hours Sunday morning? I mean, I know you're here longer than that, at least a lot of you are. And uh, then there are some who may not be here quite uh, that long. But uh, there are people who get here 10, 20, 30 minutes early sometimes. And you're here, um, uh, what? Some of you, maybe two, two and a half, three hours on Sunday morning. We have church services basically from 10 to 12. Now, don't anybody laugh when I say that. Because it's not funny. <laughs> and some of you are saying, you're right, Brother Burke Holder, it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we, we don't spend all that much time in church, do we? And of that church time, a lot of it is announcements, and we, I know that we need to make announcements, and I know there are things that have to be taken care of business-wise and so on, but how much teaching and preaching of the Word of God do we get? Add to that Sunday night. 
add to that Wednesday night. Now, uh, a friend Milo Jameson out in California said that God asked for a tenth of our money, uh, 10% of tithes and offerings of our money, and he asked for a seventh of our time. You get his idea, I'm sure, because of the seventh day, the Sabbath day, and so on. And so Milo Jameson liked to give the point out that God wants 10% of your income and he wants one-seventh of your time. Now that's 24 hours out of your week. I mean, there, I'm right about this, aren't I? There are seven days in a week. See, I still can do some thinking. And there are 24 hours in a day, right? And you say, well, uh, Brother Burke Holder, in a day I have to use some of that time eating? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, would to God we spend as much time in the Word as we did eating. Uh, I got to spend some of that time, Brother Burke Holder, in sleeping and so on. Well, I'll get back to the point, though. God is asking for 10% of our bucks and He's asking for 24 hours of our time out of a week. Now, how many of us devote 24 hours a week to the Lord? You say, well, Brother Burke Holder, I have to sleep. Okay, sleep on your time, not God's time. Right? Huh? And boy, the preacher's really gone crazy now for sure. He needs to retire and do something else. He's going overboard now. Are you right? I mean, hey, you don't get a job. And, and do, do you sleep on the job? The boss comes around, finds you sleeping on the job? <laughs> Isn't that sweet? No. I think that it's right that we try to understand. I know that I'm maybe um, going overboard just a little bit here on the 24 hours. But what I'm trying to point out is most Christians are not in the Bible very much. Most of us are not in the Word of God very much. And he wants courage. He wants strength. How are we going to get it? By being in the Word of God. How are we going to have prosperity in our lives? I mean the kind of prosperity that God labels prosperity. Not what the world labels prosperity, but what God labels as prosperity. How is it going to come about? He says, he lays the responsibility at our feet and we observe to do it. Put it into practice. Now I know somebody's going to say, well, I don't know all of it. Well, blow me over. That's for sure the truth, isn't it? In fact, the more I study the Word of God, the more I realize I don't know. Uh, there's so much in there. So many wonderful truths. There's hidden treasure in these pages, brothers and sisters. And, and indeed, we're not even scratching the surface of it. I'm convinced of that. But I've got to tell you this. Why don't we do what we do know? To be God's Word. Is my plea for each one of us. Here he says only, again, if I may, observe to do it. According to all the law, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. You can write down Psalm number 1, which we're studying on Wednesday nights a little bit. In Psalm number 1, I, I love this business. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. But now let's be honest with ourselves. Most of us do not spend the time in the Word of God that we devote to other outside interests. I'm reminded of a minister I heard on television. It's just back uh, in the old days. I was still in Houston pastoring when I heard him say this. He's a minister out of Beaumont. Uh, he said, you wouldn't believe some of the sacrifices the, the people in our church make. And then he went on to say, to get a new boat. To have a new car on the parking lot. And you can add to it whatever you want to. What about sacrificing to be in the Word of God? 
Why don't you sacrifice some of that television time? Or here's one for you, the iPhone business. I've talked about this recently in church services. What did God people cared about their Bible as much as they did their iPhone? Boy, that'd make a change in things, wouldn't it? The um, little playing around under the edge of the pew back there. Of course, I'm sure everybody's looking at Bible verses on their iPhones, but they're not playing games or texting each other. No, no, nobody'd do that in Trinity. I, I just, I know what you're thinking. Boy, Brother Burkholder's a simpleton up there. He. Yeah, well, I'm just saying this, brothers and sisters, would to God, young people, old people, all forms of people, would get with the Word as much as they did with their iPhone or their iPad or their whatever it may be in the technological world that comes along, that the world comes up with. And a lot of this stuff is good, it's fine, but it's robbed people of being in the Word of God. May God help us. Let's go a little bit further. Here just briefly. Verse number 8 says, The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, excuse me, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make the way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And I would like to bring out two more things here in closing this for this evening. And when he says, uh, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, I think I can uh, not translate, but perhaps transliterate those thoughts into this vein uh, for a moment or two. We need to guard against fear, being afraid. Have you ever been afraid? All of us have, I'm sure. And when you're afraid, you do funny things. So we need to guard against fear. Ah, oh, but that brings up a new dimension to my thinking as I say that word, fear. The fear of man bringeth a snare, according to the book of Proverbs 29 and verse number 25. We need to fear God in the proper reverential way. And we need to guard against fearing the wrong things. Our God is our strong tower of deliverance, our stronghold, and we can put our trust in Him. Be careful about fear. And again, I will repeat, the fear of man bringeth a snare and all too often all of us are bad about fearing what others think of us rather than what God thinks of us we need to fear God and then one more thing we need to guard against um, as he says here neither be dismayed and if I may please uh, discouraged has anyone here ever been discouraged? Look around you. <laughs> and there's much to be discouraged about, isn't there? And I think that God's people need to guard against discouragement because there are a couple of things the devil can do to us that really hurt us. One of them is rob us of our joy in the Lord. And another one of them is to discourage us. Because we can get to the point of getting discouraged in what follows. Giving up. Quitting. And God help us to understand that we need to fear God. And we need to, instead of being discouraged, be encouraged. How are we going to do that? I would suggest once again, it always goes full circle back to this, get into the Word of God. You're not going to find much encouragement on a television, right? Now, 
I know that we need to keep up with the news and what's going on around us and so on. But I got to tell you folks, there's a lot of discouragement out there. Even looking around at your fellow man, there's a lot of discouragement in the workplace. There's a lot of discouragement in the educational seat. There's a lot of discouragement in churches even. What's the answer? David encouraged himself in the Lord. If I can turn that around now against discouragement, just remember that. We need to be courageous in the Lord. We need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. To do so, get in the Word of God. And I trust that you may consider that God told Joshua this very thing. And then thou shalt have good success. Verse number 8, the last part. And verse number 9, For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. That's worth a lot right there. The Lord thy God is with thee. You can tap into His strength. You can tap into His power. May God help us to want to do just exactly that. We're going to do it as we get into His Word. Let us stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Father in Heaven, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the wonder of it. I thank You for the wonder of Jesus Christ our Lord. And I thank You for the magnificent Bible that we have. I pray, O oh God, that You might be with us, each one of us. I pray You'll be with this people. I pray You'd be with the church in a very special way. And I pray, God, that You'll encourage the people's hearts for Lord I know that you laid it at our feet telling us to encourage ourselves to be courageous I know all that and yet Lord I come to this point um, I am weak thou art strong and I pray oh God that you might bless this people with thine encouragement. I pray, Lord, that you'll give them those special blessings to let them know that thou art there, that you're over all, that you're watching out, that you're taking care of things, that you've got everything under control, that thy timing is perfect, that thy way is perfect. And, oh God, I pray that you might help all of us to realize and understand that the place to find this courage, the place to find this right encouragement, the place to find this strength, this right kind of strength, this stand, this right kind of stand for thee is in your word. It's not in some kind of a, a mental meditation. It is not in some kind of... Um, a fictional reading. It is in thy word. I pray, O oh God, that you may encourage each one here tonight to the point of demanding that thy word be preached, that thy word be central. Yes, both Jesus Christ, the living word, and the holy written word. I pray, O oh God, that the folks here might have that determination, that spirit of the church going in thy word under thy name and thy leadership. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Number 427 in the book if you'd like to sing along on the invitation. If God's spoken to your heart, maybe you'd like to come to the altar and just pray for God to give you courage. For God to encourage your heart. For God to give you the right priorities in being in His Word. I invite you to come. If you want to pray with me, you want me to pray with you, come to me personally. God bless you to know and do His will. God bless you to be encouraged through the Word of God. Shall we together as we sing. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasures. Jesus is mine. There's no
nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that His blessed face may be seen. Oh, how wonderful. Nothing preventing the least of His face. one good reason for having the right kind of music in church. It too feeds the soul. Our Father in Heaven, I thank you for the service this evening. I thank you for these who have come out. I pray thee to be with them. Take them safely to their homes. I pray thee to give them a good week in thy way. I pray thee, O God, to do something special for each individual here tonight, this week, to show them that thou art there that thou art on the throne, that you know all about it, that you care, and you know how to take care of it. Lord Jesus, I pray thee to watch over the families of these people. I pray, O oh God, for their lost loved ones. I pray, O oh God, that you might burden their hearts with just the right things to say to give witness of Thee. And Lord, I pray that You might help each one of us to so live that others may see Thee in us. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Good